it was a small airport back in the, in the 20s, and uh, the, the military came and established a training base in the, during the Second World War. The, uh, originally, it was the, the Army Air Corps, and then it became the U.S. Air Force. And it was a very active uh, base, and it was quite an attribute to Yuma until after the Second World War ended, and it closed, and everybody left. We were not at war anymore, and it was thought that they didn't need it anymore. And the same thing was happening with the, with the proving ground. It was closing down, and the little town of Yuma had about 9,000 population, and that was dwindling because people were, there was no construction going. Tourism had not been established yet as an interesting thing for Yuma, and, and the town had not a very bright future. So uh, with a population of 9,000 and dwindling, the Junior Chamber of Commerce said something has to be done. We have to attract attention to our good weather and try to get the air base reactivated. They came up with an endurance flight. There were some men going to a Chamber of Commerce uh, convention in Parker, Arizona, up about 80 miles from here, and they were members of the Junior Chamber of Commerce, and one of them was manager of the local radio station, Ray Smucker. He was always promoting Yuma and trying to think of things to do, and they, so two of those men, and the four men in the car, two of them knew of an endurance flight that was going on in Southern California. Two men were trying to stay aloft in a private airplane for about a thousand hours and break a world record. And they said, uh, a couple of them said, we, I know that one of those pilots, we could do that. Ray Smucker said, we could do that. We could show the whole world that Yuma has good flying weather every day. Attract attention to that because every time the flight would be mentioned, they would say Yuma, Arizona, and get the military interested in reactivating the airbase. So that's how the idea was born. Well, one of the men in the car was Woody Youngward. He was an ex-Navy pilot, and he said, to Ray Smucker when that idea came up. He said, oh, Ray, that's a good idea. He said, you find an airplane and Griff and I will fly it. Well, Horace Griffin was the manager of the, and owner of the Buick agency here. And he didn't feel that he could take the time away from that business. So they were think, trying to think of another pilot and they thought of Bob Woodhouse, who was also an ex-Navy pilot and he knew Woody very well. And, and Bob was my brother, so he became for that reason, he became the, one of the two pilots. They did find an airplane. It was loaned to them. A new airplane was loaned to them by two men that were partners in a AAA amusement company, it was called, here in Yuma. It was new. It was an Aranka sedan, four-place airplane. They took out the two back seats and the right-hand seat, and they put a cot in, sort of a mat mattress, for the off-duty pilot. They, they took turns four hours each flying, and the off-duty pilot could then sleep or exercise or do some of the chores involved with the, with the gasoline and oil. So they trained, they practiced and figured out how to handle refueling and how to stay aloft for weeks and weeks and weeks, which they finally did. They first took off in, in May of 1949 and they, they had some engine trouble after just two or three days and they, so their first attempt failed. And then it, again in August they tried again and they stayed up several days and then they had another major problem and it was hot you know it's really hot here people said you're not going to try it and oh yeah we'll go up to two or three thousand feet we'll be where it's cool you know so it took a few months to get parts and repairs done for the airplane and get it ready but then they took off on the 24th of august and they never touched the ground until the 10th of october they went to phoenix a couple of times on an errand they were supposed to drop a package to somebody in phoenix and they went over to San Diego and checked out the beaches a couple of times, but, but they stayed locally most of the time, except for one night when my brother was, the, was taking a nap and, and Woody was the pilot of the moment and he kind of dozed off and they went down into Mexico a ways before Woody, at night before Woody realized what was going on. Woke Bob up and said, where are we? Bob said, heck, I don't know, you're the pilot. Woody said, I don't think those lights look like Yuma. The refueling was, was pretty interesting. They, uh, there was a, uh, a friend of our family named George Murdoch, <laughs> whom I later married, owned a brand new Buick convertible, which he had just bought for, it's sitting right here, he bought it for $2,800. And, uh, and he and my brother started practicing with, it, with the car and with an airplane to see how the refueling might work. And it turned out that they, they took some cream cans from a dairy that were two and a half gallon capacity and wired a bale handle onto it. And the off-duty pilot sitting on the right 
could reach down when the, the car and the airplane went down the runway at the inactive abandoned air base, whatever direction they wanted to go, and would go at about around 65 miles an hour. And the crew from the car would hand up the gasoline and the off-duty pilot would reach down and pick it up. And, and, uh, and it made it maybe four cans during a run, on, and then they would do more and more runs until they had enough <coughs> to last till uh, about 12 hours later. They had, a, they had a refueling at six in the morning and one at six in the evening. Later, at, near the end of the flight, they increased and had one in the wee hours of the morning because of the engine was getting kind of tired and they didn't want too much weight in the airplane and they, they, they changed that. But uh, then as they would make a pass around, make a circle around for a second run, the off-duty pilot would pour that gasoline from that two and a half gallon can into a big reserve tank that had been installed and, and hand the empties down on the next run and take up more fulls and take up food and bathing equipment and a little bit of a change of clothing. And uh, uh, they could do, go whatever direction they wanted to according to the wind because as my brother said, it was 500 acres of asphalt abandoned, you know. The crew was all volunteer. Everything was done volunteer. Meals were prepared by a local restaurant and delivered to the airport by the police and, and everything, there, there wasn't a paid hour involved in the whole project and it was just, the, the spirit of Yuma was involved, you know. When the pilots blinked their lights at night to converse by Morse code with their friends on the ground, every little old lady in town thought they were blinking back at her and her porch light, you know. They were, they were like, they were the heroes of the day. They started getting national attention at some point as they neared the uh, breaking the record. And, and there was a program called Morgan Beatty's News of the World on radio. And he got involved at about the time they broke the record. And he actually interviewed the pilots by radio every night on his News of the World. Arizona Radio carried it all the time. And then the newsreels got involved at some point in time, probably kind of late in the flight. And they had a, a news service. They received uh, newspaper clippings from 32 different countries. So it did get, literally, it did get worldwide attention. They landed on the 10th of October. And, uh, it, and the, the whole town, when they broke the record, the whole town, the lights went out, everything turned off. You know, I, I missed all of that because I was away at school. But then when the actual record was broken, um, every siren and train whistle and church bell and you know every, and car horn and taxis everything made noise you know it was pretty exciting big party big parade and celebration in the city they didn't complain about anything they uh th people asked if they were bored and they said no there was enough to do they somehow didn't complain about anything and uh and and ne neither did the wives complain you know, they, they both had jobs, and yet they were out there for all the refuelings. They took it really well. They, they lost a little bit of weight. They had a pretty good diet plan, but uh, they lost a few pounds. They were thin. They were not overweight. But, so that was, that was not serious, but it did, it did happen. What ultimately ends up happening to the base? It reopened w within a little more than a year. I mean, in 1951, it reopened and became so active, and now every military, every Navy or Marine pilot in the country trained right here. And uh, commanding officers of both bases gave a great deal of credit to the publicity that the flight brought to, to bring, you know, the air base back and the proving ground reopened again too. So, and the city went from 9,000 to, I think the last I heard was 110, it's probably more than that now. What happened to the plane? Well, unfortunately it was sold. Somebody, nobody knows why in the world the city of Yuma let that airplane get away, but it did. And then my dear friend, Jim Gillespie, who was a co-author of the book with me, The Longest Flight, he and another man decided to try to trace it down through the FAA. And they went through the records of 19 different owners during all those years, uh, about 50 years. They were, they were in advance of the 50th anniversary of the flight. They found the airplane in Minnesota, by, owned by a farmer, he had floats on it for it to land on lakes, you know. And the Chamber of Commerce got involved and purchased it from the man. He was willing to sell it because he realized, you know, its importance by that time. So they went there in a U-Haul truck, brought it back, and spent about two years restoring it back to its original condition, paint job and everything. It's been in storage room for years uh, without a, new, a good home. 
And uh, Mayor Krieger said, well, before he was elected, he said, if I'm elected, I'm going to find a home for that airplane. And eventually, it was arranged to be put here in, in City Hall. And then my husband and I decided to let the city use the car. It, it, we found a car like the refueling car. It, the refueling car was worn out. We figured it made f about 1,500 quick starts and stops, and it was totally worn out. But eventually, my husband and I found another car of the same model and restored it back to the same color and red leather seats and everything and have loaned it sort of indefinitely to the city. What do you think would have happened to the city of Yuma if those pilots hadn't gotten in that plane? It probably would have just <laughs> struggled along. Maybe eventually tourism would have, uh, would have become a matter of interest, but certainly nothing like it happened with the military. Those pilots were like our astronauts. It was a local big deal, and it made a huge difference in the future of Yuma.